Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Ride and Handling, Testing, Modification and Development. What I want to cover in today's video are five things people very often get wrong about car suspension. Now, where did I get to this point? How did I get to this point? I've just spent a year writing this book. During its writing, I gained feedback from four world suspension experts who read every word on every page. I also went through my extensive personal library of car suspension books, over 45 of them. And I've got 40 years of experience of modifying cars, my own cars, including every aspect of suspension that you can imagine. So what are the five things that people often get wrong? The first one is that people often think that to improve a vehicle's handling, you need to change everything. Change the springs, change the sway bars, change the dampers, the shocks, change the bushes, change the wheel alignment. You know, if it's on the car and it's standard, it must go. Now, that's typically wrong. What you really need to do is to identify what is the car doing badly in its handling and what can I do to fix that particular bad characteristic. So if the car understeers, I could increase rear roll stiffness. I could do that with sway bars. I can do that with springs. If it's transient, when you're turning into the corner, I can change bump damping shocks as well. If the car power oversteers, okay, I can soften the rear, etc. So, so what you do is you identify what the car is doing badly, and then you make specific changes to fix only that problem. Now, if the car's got worn out suspension, it's an old banger, you might be changing everything. But if the car's suspension is in good nick, it's quite rare to actually have to change everything on the car to get it to handle. But the steps are these. Number one, what is the car actually doing badly? Can I identify that or, or those characteristics? Number two, what can I do to fix those particular specific deficiencies? Now, if you take that approach, you're likely to spend vastly less money and you're also likely, much more likely, to fix the problems. So changing absolutely everything, if the suspension is already in good condition, is actually quite rare. You don't need to do that. The second thing that you see people often implicitly stating is that the tyres fix handling. And so someone might say, uh, a car handled really badly, but I've got these high performance tyres and now it handles really well. Now, that's typically not the case because we've got two different aspects there. We've got tyres that provide grip and then we've got handling that typically provides progressiveness, provides balance, provides that the car does what the driver wants it to do. Now, if you've got a given car, and you increase the grip level by changing all four tires, same size, just increase the, the quality of the tire, you'll probably have the same handling, it'll just occur at a slightly higher speed. So you haven't changed understeer, oversteer balance, you haven't changed progressiveness of the car, you haven't changed predictability of the car, you typically haven't changed any of those things, which are fundamental handling trays, instead what you've done is change grip. Now, if all you do is want more grip, then fine, go to more high performance tires. But if you want to actually have more grip with more handling balance, more progressiveness, more predictability, then you're going to have to change more than just the tires. So I always prefer to actually start by getting the car handling well and then increasing grip. I know some people say, oh, but that's all wrong. You know, everything's built around the tires. Well, maybe, maybe not. Tires change grip. In my experience, they don't change handling very much. This was an interesting one. Um, a lot of aftermarket companies imply that they sell matched springs and dampers. You know, coilovers, oh, well, the springs and dampers are matched for your car. It's a nice idea, but in reality, it very seldom, if ever, actually happens. And, and the reason it doesn't happen is because it's too expensive. If you've got a aftermarket manufacturer selling a kit for a car, to get the springs right for the car might take oh, a few weeks of development. To get the dampers right for those springs and the car might take another few weeks of development, month of development. You know, maybe some manufacturers do it, but if they're selling kits for 30 or 40 different cars, you can see it would become incredibly expensive. 
Now, matching dampers to springs and cars typically requires the use of a damper dyno and a lot of testing. Um, you're, you're tuning the low shaft speed, the high shaft speed, uh, damper, damper shaft speed for bump and rebound. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, typically aftermarket companies don't do that. They simply don't have the resources to do that. And where does that leave you? It leaves us in a difficult position because to get dampers that are really well set up for a car is going to cost you a lot of money going to a specialist damper company and even adjustable dampers. You know, most adjustable dampers have only one knob that changes both bump and rebound and whether it's high speed or low speed is often a bit problematic and changes them by the same ratio. You, you can't change the ratio of those two. And then you go to dampers that have two knobs, one for bump, one for rebound. But what about high speed and low speed? And by the time you get to a damper that's got four knobs or the equivalent thereof, it's incredibly expensive. And there's no easy answer to that. Um, the best bet is to go with dampers that someone else has run successfully on the same type of car. If they're happy and if, you know, especially if you can experience their car, then, then you're ahead of the game. But be very wary when people will say, oh, ours are matched. Of course they're matched. Typically, even the best companies might just trial four different off-the-shelf dampers and pick the best of those four, but that's completely different from internally tuning the damper to suit your application. The, the real exception, and the only real exception to that, is uh, where your car has got electronically controlled damping and there's an aftermarket plug-in controller, programmable controller. And uh, my Porsche Cayman has got uh, PASM, um, the Porsche Electronic Adjustable Damping System, and I've got a plug-in aftermarket programmable controller on that, and you really can tune the dampers for, for road use and, and your roads and your car and so on, because you've got full programmable control over what the dampers are doing. That's a fantastic system, but unfortunately it applies very, very rarely. Not, not very many cars have those systems with an adjustable plug-in programmable controller. The fourth one is if you improve handling, ride quality then suffers. Now, that's not true because, or well, it's not true in every case anyway, because there are some things that cause bad handling that also cause bad ride. Um, the most obvious one is overly stiff suspension, really stiff springs, really stiff dampers, really stiff sway bars. Um, you're going to have very high ride accelerations, vertical accelerations, roll accelerations, pitch accelerations, and that's going to give a really lousy ride quality. And on any real road with bumps, potholes, you know, frost heaves, real roads, you're also going to have quite poor handling because the car is going to be jumping from bump to bump. Another example of where um, bad handling can be associated with a bad ride is when the car is lowered too far and you're hitting bump stops. So if you hit a bump stop uh, on the suspension when you go over a road bump, obviously again your vertical acceleration is going to be really high, bad ride quality. And if you're cornering and you hit a bump stop, then the spring rate effectively changes dramatically. So if you hit a front uh, bump stop when you're cornering hard, then you're likely to get instant understeer. If you hit a rear bump stop when cornering hard, you're likely to get instant oversteer. And in fact, I've had a car which was too low from the factory, and that's how it was produced, I think, for, for low aerodynamic drag purposes. And lifting the car, raising the car slightly, and running stiffer springs improved both the ride and handling substantially. You really would have thought that the springs were softer, not stiffer, but it was up off the bump stops. It wasn't hitting those bump stops all the time, and that gave both ride and handling benefits. So the idea that it's always a trade-off of one to the other is not the case. And the last one, suspension is really complicated to understand. Now, people often don't actually say that. They just start spouting all this stuff, which is, you know, unintelligible to normal people, you know, talking about your response and roll centres and oh, it goes on and on and on. And you read all this and you think, wow, this is hard. Take a step back. Improving the ride and handling on a given car is actually usually quite straightforward. You know, designing the suspension of a car from scratch is incredibly complicated. That really is complicated. We get all these trade-offs, all these different designs. Uh, it, it, it's incredibly complicated, but that's not what we're doing. 
99.9% of have a car and we want to make it handle better. Now, that means we're not changing roll centres, we're not changing virtual pivot points, we're not changing virtual swing arms, we're not changing pitch moments, etc., etc. All we're doing is trying to make a given car handle better. And as I say, I think that's pretty straightforward. You know, what's wrong with it? Going back to the point I made earlier, what's wrong with it and therefore how can we fix it? Um, it, it it's a different kettle of fish designing a car from scratch, but that's not what we're doing. And if someone starts to talk in a language you think is impossible to understand, it's probably because they're going down a rabbit burrow. They're probably going somewhere where you don't even need to go. Um, and, and so uh, if you're starting to frown and think, oh my gosh, this is all just getting so complicated, I must be dumb because I must need to understand all this stuff, you typically don't. What you need to do is say, here's what my car is doing, which I don't want it to do. Therefore, how can I fix that? Right, let's do that. Let's fix it. The other thing about that, and, and I guess it's a continuation of that idea, is uh, ride and handling on cars is always a developmental process. Even the biggest manufacturers in the world with all their computers and all their engineers, they, they might design a suspension on paper, but they test it in real life. Okay, even things like uh, steering uprights, the knuckles, uh, and so all those positions of those joints, which changes roll steer and changes all this, they can do it all on a computer and then they test real ones to see what it's really like on the road. And so if you've got a car which has got certain deficiencies and you want to improve it, it will be almost certainly a developmental process. You know, oh, let me try that, that bigger sway bar. Yeah, that's pretty well on the right track. Hey, that, that's fine, that's perfect, great. You fluked it at the first go. But often it will be an iterative process. It will be a sequence of, of steps if you want to get really the very, very best results. And of course, if you have a suspension with adjustment, whether that's the knobs on the dampers that I talked about earlier, whether that's um, different holes on the sway bar lengths to give you different stiffnesses, that's all to the good because you can make tuning changes more cheaply and more easily. But just suspension is really complicated. Yes, it can be if you decide to approach it in that way. But instead, if you start off by saying, what's wrong with my car and how can I fix it? It actually becomes really quite straightforward in comparison. The book's called Vehicle Ride and Handling, Testing, Modification, Development. It covers all of those ideas. It covers, here's what's wrong with my car. Now, here are the different things I can use to fix it. And it covers that on the basis of front-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, and all-wheel drive cars. And it also does talk about some of those more complicated ideas that I touched on in point number five that you can use for your background understanding, but you often don't, as I say, need to know all that stuff in order to improve the handling of your car. It's not a cheap book. It's uh, 350 pages, full color, large format. People are surprised when it arrives that it's such a big book. It's obviously print costs and handling costs go up when it's a big book, but I am absolutely confident the first time you use its content, in order to make a decision as to what to do with your car, you will have more than saved the cost of the book in terms of not wasting money on parts you don't need or not going down a blind alley or not going in the wrong direction. Thank you.